So in this video, we're going to focus on the neuroglia. If you'll remember going back to the histology chapter, we talked about how nervous tissue had two major cell types within it. We had neuroglia and neurons. Now the neuroglia, we also call glial cells, and these are, neuro these are cells that outnumber neurons about 10 to 1. They're smaller and they surround and wrap delicate neurons, and some are involved with immune defense and a variety of interesting functions we'll talk about in this lecture. Now in further lectures, we'll go into more detail on neurons or nerve cells, and these differ from neuroglia because they're the excitable cells that transmit electrical signals that can uh, basically inv be involved with high-speed communication around the body. So in terms of the types of neuroglia cells, we have four major types here. We have astrocytes, microglia, ependymal cells, and oligodendrocytes. But these are the ones that you find in the central nervous system. It turns out we actually have a separate set of glial cells in the peripheral nervous system. And the reason being is just that these two divisions of your nervous system develop in different ways, so you find that there's different cell types between them. Now, uh, the astrocytes are the most abundant, and they're called astrocyte because astro means star, cell, site is cell. So they're kind of a star-shaped cell. They're versatile, highly branched, hence the star appearance, and they cling to neurons and synaptic endings, as well as capillaries. Now, by being highly branched, they can actually help to support and brace neurons, they play a role in exchanging materials between capillaries and neurons, and therefore part of what we call the blood-brain barrier. Astrocytes early on in, in neural development help guide the migration of young neurons by sending out little scaffolding rods of protein that uh, essentially neurons can, can walk along. And uh, astrocytes also control the chemical environment around neurons, ensuring that the proper, proper chemical environment exists so that neurons can transmit action potentials. They can respond to nerve impulses and neurotransmitters. They influence neuronal functioning. And astrocytes can participate in information processing within the brain. So uh, it turns out these last three are kind of a more recent discovery about astrocytes. But it seems that they actually play a role in communication as well. Now in terms of what they look like, remember these things are abundant and highly branched. So you can see here the cell body and all these extensions that stick off. And you can see a lot of these extensions actually wrap around blood vessels. And this is important because astrocytes are involved in what we call the blood-brain barrier because they basically prevent harmful substances in your blood from making it into your brain tissue. Neurons also help to transmit nutrients to, um, I'm sorry, astrocytes also help to transmit nutrients to neurons. And uh, these nutrients then are actually able to be absorbed by those neurons and utilized. But astrocytes also play a pretty key role in maintaining and monitoring the extracellular environment here. So what we find then is that uh, the fluid environment within our brain is actually maintained and monitored by our astrocytes so that if one ion gets in excess like potassium, you know, astrocytes can actually help to remove that and get those potassium levels back to a normal concentration within our brain's tissue fluid. Now, uh, what's not shown here, but what should be present, is also the fact that astrocytes monitor synapses and they play a role in communication because a synapse is a point of communication between a neuron and another cell but astrocytes actually play a role with monitoring those synapses and communicating. Now microglial cells are the small ovoid cells with thorny processes that touch and monitor neurons. Uh, these can migrate towards injured neurons and can transform into an activated form which phagocytose microorganisms and neuronal debris. So think of the microglial cells as like the immune cells of your brain. They're phagocytes because they can remove infectious organisms as well as dead material. In fact, for someone who has a stroke or a part of their brain dies, that dead nervous tissue is basically reabsorbed by these microglial cells because they phagocytose it. And what you're left with is basically just a space that's fluid filled where there used to be brain tissue. Now the microglial cells, you can see these kind of thorny-like cells here, and normally they exist in the brain in their inactive form. So they're, they're just there, but they're activated by chemicals as well as exposure to foreign microorganisms. And once activated, these microglial cells help, help to mount an immune response by initiating inflammation, but also turning into a large phagocyte, which can engulf and remove debris from the brain. Now, the ependymal cells can range in shape from either squamous to columnar, and these may or may not be ciliated, but these ependymal cells with cilia can beat to circulate cerebral spinal fluid around the brain, and they line the central cavities of our brain and spinal cord. Now, ependymal cells form a permeable barrier between cerebral spinal fluid and the cavities in our brain called the ventricles, and the function of cerebral spinal fluid is to help keep your brain buoyant 
and nourish the brain from the inside. So these impenetrable cells play a very important role with helping to circulate this fluid that nourishes and protects our brain. So what do these look like? Well, they kind of line up like an epithelium, and they line the, the fluid-filled cavities deep within our brain. So they almost look like a simple cuboidal epithelium. And what these cells do is essentially take some of the substances you'd find in the fluid near your blood vessels and then uh, transport those substances across their walls in order to make this new fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. And they can circulate that fluid by the cilia that they have that can all wave and beat in a very specific and coordinated manner to help circulate this fluid um, around the inside of your brain spaces but also um, outside of your brain. Now, the oligodendrocytes are these large branch cells that process and wrap central nervous system nerve fibers. They can form this insulating myelin sheath that's thicker than nerve fibers, and their purpose here is to actually help speed up the electrical impulses that are created by your neurons. So they form this myelin, which is this external wrapping and sheath, and it looks a lot like the insulation around a wire. Well, these, these yellow wires here, orange, would essentially be the processes from our nerve cells that would conduct electrical currents. So these myelin sheaths serve as like an insulator for the wires of our brain. So uh, in the peripheral nervous system, we have two major neuroglia. We have satellite cells and Schwann cells, also called neurolemocytes. Now the satellite cells surround neuron cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system, and their function is very similar to the astrocytes of your central nervous system, in the sense that they help to basically protect and monitor the environment around those neurons. Now, Schwann cells are functionally very similar to oligodendrocytes. And they're also called neurolemocytes. But they basically surround peripheral nerve fibers and form the myelin sheath or insulation in thicker nerve endings. And these are more vital to regeneration of damaged peripheral nerves because the neurolemocytes can help guide the severed axons of your neurons to reconnect if you have nerve injury. So the satellite cells surround the cell bodies of peripheral neurons, and remember the Schwann cells or neurolemocytes form the myelin sheath or the insulation around the axons of your neurons in the peripheral nervous system.